Our current economic situation is being propped up by an increasing amount of consumer debt, inflation, a sky-high housing market, and a job market that on the surface seems really strong. But not everything is what it seems. Last week, I made a video talking about how new cars and their loans are going to crash the economy. And in that video, I analyzed new car prices and compared these prices to the median household income. To give you the Cliff Notes version, over the last 10 years, new car prices have increased by 50%. Homes have increased by 75%. And food for the average household has increased by 31%, while the median household income has only increased by 13%. And all the while, people continue to buy cars, they continue to buy homes, and we continue to buy food. I mean, we do need it to survive. And while I wholeheartedly believe that car debt, which has hit a record high in the last few months, is going to be a huge factor when it comes to the looming recession, there is also evidence to suggest that a looming recession could assist in the process of crashing the car market. And so in today's video, I'm gonna be peeling back the curtain and I'm gonna be talking about what's currently going on in the economy, how this is going to affect the car market, and most importantly, what this means for you and how you can prepare. Because truthfully, based off of the data that I'm gonna be discussing in this video, we should all be concerned. And if you're somebody who's looking to save money, I have the perfect suggestion for you, which is why I'd like to take a moment to talk about Mint Mobile and thank them for partnering with me on this video. As a business owner, I like to keep track of where I spend my money. And as someone who owns multiple businesses, I spend a lot of it. Between gas, insurance, internet, and more, I spend thousands of dollars each and every month. And I'm constantly looking for easy ways to decrease my spending without sacrificing the quality of the things that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, which is exactly why I've turned to Mint Mobile and why I've partnered with them so that you can save money by switching to Mint Mobile too. Now, I may not be as convincing as Ryan Reynolds. Hey there, it's Ryan Reynolds, owner of Mint Mobile. But let me tell you why switching to Mint Mobile could be the exact thing that you need in order to decrease your expenses. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless plans for as low as $15 per month. And the best thing is, is that you don't have to sacrifice coverage, data, or speed. They're built on the nation's largest 5G network, which means that you get consistent, fast performance. And they sell directly to you online, which means that you don't have to deal with phone stores, salesmen, or middlemen. I hate middlemen. The best part is you can keep your current plan and phone number, which makes switching plans a breeze. At the end of the day, I understand how essential having reliable internet is to your day-to-day -day life, but that doesn't mean that you have to overpay for it. To get premium wireless internet starting at just $15 per month, go to www.mintmobile.com slash By most indicators and metrics, the U.S. economy is doing okay. Unemployment is at a record low 3.4%, and people are still buying things, which is oftentimes an indicator of overall economic health. Air travel has reached and surpassed 2019 levels for the first time since the pandemic. And according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, consumer spending was at 1.8% in January. The point is people are spending money. And typically spending is a good economic indicator and it's a sign of good economic growth because as people spend money, that money then gets pumped up back into the economy, which then can be dispersed in other places. So for example, if I spend $100 at a restaurant, that's just not me flushing $100 down the toilet. That's me spending $100 that contributes to someone else's salary that then allows them to go spend money elsewhere that contributes to that person's salary, and it creates this never-ending cycle that helps stimulate the country and the world. Spending is what helps pump money through the economy. At least, that's what I continue to tell myself. Guess what? It grows the economy. The problem though is that these cookie cutter economic metrics are smoke and mirrors that are propped up by consumer debt. The median household income has gone from 62,000 to 70,000. And I want you to keep this in mind when we're going through this video because truthfully, it's very concerning. Total consumer credit owned and securitized here in the United States is at record highs and has been on a pretty steep rise for the last 10 years. Consumer loans, meaning credit cards and other revolving plans has also reached an all-time high. Auto loan debt in the US reached an all-time high in December of 2022, sitting at $1.52 trillion. And total consumer debt has reached a record high of $16.9 trillion just last month. And as I mentioned in my previous video on this topic, new cars have increased in price by 50%, the median cost of a home has increased by 75%, and all the while our income has only increased by 13%. And the thing is, is that if we look at the US economy, especially post COVID, things look as though they're doing quite well. People continue to buy cars, continue to buy houses, continue to go on vacation, continue to entertain themselves regardless of the price. The reality is it seems as though everyone across the country is still buying and doing things that cost a lot of money. 
which gives us the facade that things are going very, very well. But it is no coincidence that while the cost of cars, food, homes, general everyday goods are going up, so is credit card and consumer debt, as showed by this graph from the Federal Reserve. The problem though lies with the fact that this simply cannot last forever, and it seems as though time is already beginning to run out. Delinquency rates on credit cards are rising, though they're still at historically lows, they are nearing pre-pandemic levels for the first time in three years. Charge-off rates on credit cards are also increasing, again, still lower historically, but quickly rising to pre-pandemic levels. Auto loan delinquencies rose 26.7% from a year ago, and now of all loans, about 1.84% are severely delinquent, which is the highest rate since 2009. Mortgage delinquencies in Q4 of 2022 increased, still at overall low but they are increasing. All the while, the average American saves only 4.7% of their income. This isn't quite a record low, but it's near record lows as you can see from this graph. This is all with the backdrop of a job market that's quickly taking a turn. Now, the unemployment rate here in the United States is at 3.4%, which historically speaking is very good. But hundreds of thousands of employees have been laid off over the last few months, and there's really no signs of that slowing down. With companies like Twitter, Disney, Dell, Google, PayPal, Microsoft, Amazon, Salesforce, DirecTV, IBM, and so many more that I couldn't possibly name them in this video. Layoffs are occurring, most notably and frequently in the tech sector, but the impact that this is going to have on the entire job market and the economy as a whole is going to continue to be significant. One thing I think is really interesting and concerning with these layoffs is the fact that they've been affecting predominantly the tech industry. And over the last few years, the tech industry has been an industry with notoriously high pay. It was relatively common for middle managers within some of these tech companies to be making half a million dollars a year, if not more, with many others making over a million. These are the workers that are getting laid off from these tech companies, and these are the same workers that are now having to go out and find a job with regular companies with regular pay structures. Thing is, is that working as a middle manager making half a million dollars a year is basically unheard of outside of the tech industry. So now these people have been let go from their tech jobs at some of these prestigious companies, and they are having a very hard time finding a replacement job, let alone finding one that has a similar pay. I believe that this will have a domino effect on the overall job market, because this is not only leading to more competition within the tech sector, but within the entire job market as a whole. Workers are not only having to fight for a job, but they're also having to settle for lower paying ones. And what happens whenever these workers can no longer fund their high six or seven figure lifestyles? Additionally is the topic of home mortgages. And this is something that people have been discussing nonstop for the last two years. I myself am a housing crash believer. And the idea behind a housing crash today in 2023 is basically the thought that in 2021, housing prices went up far too much. And well, what comes up must come down. Obviously there's a bit more to it than that, but that kind of covers it. But the counter argument to that is that a housing market will in fact not happen because of the fact that today in 2023, people simply have too much equity in their home that it would prevent a crash from actually happening. Today, if somebody can no longer afford their home, they can simply sell it and make a profit because they have equity in it. Unlike back in 2008, whenever the housing market was caused and accelerated by the fact that people lost equity in their home. But this counter argument is under the assumption that home prices will in fact continue to go up or at the very least stay the same. But according to recent data, this isn't what's happening. According to Redfin, home prices have fallen annually for the first time in a decade, which you can see here as 2023 data very slightly crosses over 2022 data. So home prices are going down and data suggests that they will continue to go down. And while of course people who bought their home in the early 2000s or even really up until 2020, they are not the ones who are at risk of losing equity in their home because they gained so much over the years. But the people who purchased their home in 2021 or 2022 at an inflated price, well the same can't be said for them. And they are absolutely at risk of losing equity. On the same topic of mortgages, the other counter argument that I continuously hear is that people simply will not sell their homes because of the extremely good interest rates that they have on those mortgages. And because of this, housing supply will remain relatively the same, and as a result, prices will stay stagnant if not continue to go up. And this would be true, assuming that people could continue to afford their homes. Assuming that a housing market will not occur because of the fact that people have a low interest rate and thus a lack of interest in selling their home is making the large and 
inaccurate assumption that everybody who has a low interest rate has a choice in whether or not they can or cannot keep their home. And anybody who has ever gone through tough financial times knows that this isn't true. The reality is, is that if somebody loses their job, if their credit card debt catches up to them, if their high car payment catches up to them, and if they have no savings to keep them afloat in the meantime, well, they may not have any other choice but to sell their home regardless of how great their interest rate is. And the reality is the data doesn't lie. Over the last two years, the average American in relation to their income has overspent on a home, a car, virtually every aspect of their life. And this is backed up by data and that's simply not sustainable. And in order to bring this entire mortgage discussion back into the context of the car market, I do think that there is some validity in the slow interest argument made whenever we're talking about the housing market. And while I don't think that low interest rates are going to prevent people from selling or foreclosing on their home entirely whenever times get tough, I do think that it will cause people to sell virtually everything they can before they sell their home. If someone loses their job or their debt catches up to them, their house is not going to be the first major expense that they cut, especially not at the coveted 2.4% interest rate. But you know what will be on the chopping block? Their car loan. I believe that reckless consumer spending is going to lead to a housing crash. But I also believe that before that happens, reckless consumer spending is going to lead to a car market crash. I said it in my previous video, I said it in this one, and I'll probably continue to say it throughout 2023, but the numbers do not lie. Over the last decade, our income has increased by 13%, but total consumer debt has increased by nearly 130% in that same period of time. At some point, and I'm not exactly sure when, this consumer debt is absolutely going to catch up to the people that owe it. As a result, the housing market will crash, the car market will crash, and the economy will get worse. And as far as what you can do in order to prepare, well, I do have a few tips. First, don't panic. Time in the market always beats timing the market. Don't panic sell anything just because you worry that investment will go to zero, because chances are it won't. Cut unnecessary expenses. I've been doing this with myself and my business for the better part of the last year, trying to figure out how I can stay lean finance-wise while continue to grow my income. And last but not least, save. Cash is king in a recession, and I'm holding on to as much cash as possible in an effort to take advantage of a recession once it's officially here. But like always, you guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it. So make sure to leave a comment down below. And while you guys are at it, make sure to hit the like button, hit that subscribe button, and hit the notification bell. And I'll see you guys in the next video.